1 Thessalonians. We're going to continue our study on the second coming of Christ. How many realize Jesus is coming soon? Amen? About four of you, okay. Jesus said, I will come again. That's not something I made up. That's not something I inserted in God's word. That is something Jesus said. It's his promise. We began this series asking two important questions. The first was, how do you think about the second coming of Jesus Christ? Sadly, in the church today, many times we get caught up with the cares of life and we fail to think about the fact that Jesus is coming again. Then there are others who want to take that truth and use it as a a whip and manipulate people. And that's not what it's intended for. Others will will try to sensationalize it or capitalize on it. But it's all about Jesus, church. It's about Jesus coming back, returning for his bride. Amen? And we're looking forward to it. The second question I asked last week was, are you ready for the return of Jesus? And it got very quiet in here. James said, I stomped on his toes. We ask that question because Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, in discussing his return, said there's going to be three different types of division. The first division that's going to take place is between those that know him as Lord and Savior and have a personal relationship with him and those that do not. And I'm thankful today I know him. Are you? But there's going to be another division that we looked at, a division that speaks about a division of the eternal things that we've given our life for and the things that are going to be burned up. In that division, it talked about weeping. And we noted that In Revelation, it says that there will be weeping, but Jesus will wipe away every tear. That verse doesn't make sense unless there's going to be some kind of weeping in heaven. I believe at least a portion of that will come from our realization of what we've done with our lives and how little of our lives we've used for His glory. There was one final division that we looked at, and it was the parable of the the ten virgins. And we saw that five virgins had extra oil for their lamps. They were prepared, and five didn't. And there was a message there. It wasn't five virgins being stingy and not sharing what they had. The message there is that you can't rely on someone else's relationship with the Lord, you must personally have a born-again relationship with Jesus Christ. And that you are not ready for the second coming of the Lord unless there is a current work of God's Holy Spirit in your life. Well, today I want to look at when Jesus comes again. What's going to happen when Jesus comes again? Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. How many are looking forward to that? (laughs) Amen. That's a heavenly announcement that Jesus is coming for his bride. And the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. 
Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This passage of Scripture is very comforting. I couldn't begin to estimate the number of funerals that I've quoted this passage or the number of graveside services where I've read this portion of Scripture. Because it brings comfort to us, it brings encouragement to us, because we know that things aren't just going to continue to get worse and nothing good's going to happen. But we know that God has a plan that at the appointed time, Jesus is going to return for the church, we're going to be caught up together, and we'll be with Him forever. Amen? And church, we have a hope today in Christ. Amen? We have a hope. Well, let's look at this passage of Scripture. There's several things I want us to see. And there's three prominent things in eschatology that I want us to see. Eschatology is that portion of theology that concerns dealing with last things. The last things. And this portion of Scripture gives us great insight into it. And sadly, many times we want to focus on things that aren't brought out clear, but are more speculative. And and church, I think we need to focus, it's not that we can't discuss those things that are speculative, but we need to focus and rejoice and proclaim the certainties that are in the Word of God. The first certainty is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is going to return for His bride. Amen? The second is the dead in Christ shall rise. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead. And third is the eternal state. And what I mean by that is heaven and hell. And church, I don't compromise the Word of God. I want you to understand Jesus talked about hell. It is a reality. We don't like to think about it. I certainly don't like to preach about it. It's not a fun topic, but church, it's a reality that we need to hear, we need to understand. Yes, there's heaven to gain, and there is hell to shun. And one of those two places will be our eternal destiny. And if you're here today and you've committed your life to Jesus, you've opened your heart to Him, you've said, Lord, come into my life. I receive your forgiveness, your grace, your mercy, your love. You are my Lord and my Savior. I receive that gift of salvation that you paid for with your precious blood on the cross. You died for my sin. And because of that, I am born again. Then you know without a doubt, you have a certainty in your heart, you're going to go to be with Him one day. Is anybody excited about that? (laughs) That ought to make you want to do your happy dance. Amen? Whether whether I die in this or whether I'm raptured out of here, either way, I'm going to be with Jesus because of what he did for me. And that's a certainty for us today. Those three things. Sadly, many people want to focus on the speculative things in prophecy. They want to focus on the rebuilding of the temple or the Antichrist or the mark of the beast, the two, who are the two witnesses, who are the 144,000, or they want to focus on the, the end time judgment. In church, it's okay to talk about those things. Those things are part of the Word of God. They're in Scripture, but they shouldn't be our focus because we have some things in prophecy that are certainties, and we need to proclaim those certainties and rejoice in those certainties. We we look at those things, and we want to talk about their order of appearance or their interpretation. And I don't believe that they're given to us for us to sit around and speculate on these things. In fact, Jesus himself in Matthew 24 made a statement. The disciples came to him and said, what are the signs of the, of the end of this age? And in that passage, he says this in verse 33. He says, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. 
Church, as, as with most prophecy in, Bibles, in, in the Bible, in the New Testament, Old Testament, we don't understand exactly every detail of the prophecy until it has taken place and we look back at it and then it all makes sense. And I believe that is the, the way it's going to be with much of the end time prophecy. And it's given to us, so not so that we sit around and speculate, but that, so when it does happen, we can say, look, Jesus told us this. The Word of God predicted this. This is what God was talking about, and it brings an assurance to us that it's just not an accident in history, but that God is on the throne, in control, that His plan is being fulfilled, and we're right there in it, knowing that we have the assurance God is in control. Amen? I want us to begin, look at verse 16 with me again. The three certainties, the coming of Jesus, the resurrection, and man's eternal state. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. So first of all, there's going to be a great heavenly announcement. Jesus himself is coming back. It is him. He is going to come back with a shout. He's excited about you. He loves you. He's finally coming back to gather his bride. And he comes back shouting about you. Amen. There's also a voice of an archangel. And also the trumpet of God is going to be sounding. And the second thing, the dead in Christ will rise first. Now this needs to be understand, understood in the context of what was taking place here. Now Paul was writing a letter to this church at Thessalonica because he didn't have a great deal of time there with them. It was one of his shortest stays in planning a church. He had taught them about the second coming of Jesus. They were excited about it, but there was a misunderstanding and they didn't understand. What happened is some of their family, their church family, passed away and they thought that they were going to miss out on Jesus' return and the rapture. So they were upset about that. And so Paul is addressing that with the church. So that he says, I don't want you to be ignorant. He's, he's saying, I want you to understand, to have the knowledge, is what he's saying. And so he says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now when we think, of, well, when are we going to rise? Well, it addresses that. It, it, it's, it's just like that. Okay? There's not a great time span. We're going to be caught up together. But he was reassuring the church so that they would understand your loved ones that have died are not going to be left out of this glorious occasion. Amen? And so Paul is addressing that in this passage. In verse 13 he says, I do not want you to be ignorant, brother, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So Paul is bringing comfort to the church and for those who have died. Yesterday, we had a glorious funeral right here in the church. It was Pastor Riley, our founding pastor's daughter-in-law. Sue Riley passed away. And she was only 57 years old. Very young. But she knew Jesus. She loved Him with all of her heart. Therefore, there was a, there was a hope that filled this place. And there should be a hope in your heart today. Amen. A hope, a genuine hope. Thirdly, it discusses in this passage that living believers will instantly be translated. Look at verse 17. When we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So the dead in Christ are going to rise first. They're they're going to have a new resurrected body, okay? And then we're going to be caught up right after them. You got the picture? Now notice, they're resurrected, but we're translated. Their bodies have died, 
that they're going to be brought back to life and our bodies are going to be instantly changed. And let me tell you, with every day, I long more for that. Is anybody with me? <laughs> I'm ready for a glorified body. Amen. I'm ready for that. For both groups will suddenly be raptured and transported to meet Jesus in the air. What a glorious time that's going to be. Now, fourth, both of these groups are going to be raptured, transported together. So there's a heavenly announcement. Amen? You looking forward to that? The resurrection of the dead, then we're going to be translated, then both groups are going to be caught up to be with Him. Sadly, in our culture today... There's, there are many people that are struggling with what happens when you die. Our culture realizes that life is very short. And there's a yearning, a longing for more than just this life that God created in us. And today you have books about the afterlife. You have people that are go to the occult, they go to seances. Years ago, I had a, a young man, that, or he was an older man, actually, that gave his life to Jesus, but his wife had passed away. And he came to me, and he was struggling. He said, Pastor, I went to a medium. medium and she began to tell me things that there's no way that she should have known. And he said, it seems so real and so powerful, and, and he's just going on and on. And I said, what you did was of, the, was of the occult, it was demonic, and yes, demons were there. They knew the history of your wife they, and you. They knew all this stuff, and it was easy for them to speak through this lady. But it was not God. And I said, you need to leave that alone. And that's what's sad is today, instead of reading God's Word and being comforted and encouraged by God's Word, we get off track many times, even Christians, and we seek out answers in the world. And church, those answers are not reality. The reality is found in the Word of the living God. Amen? And we can rejoice. We can walk with assurance. Just a few months ago, I buried my father. He went to be with Jesus. And I preached his funeral. You ask, how could you do that? Weren't you sad? Yes, I was. Yes, I had to hold back the tears. But at the same time, I had a genuine hope. This text talks about a hope that we have. It's not like the world. When you come together in a funeral, and it's a funeral of the world, there's hopelessness. They have no hope. They think this is all there is. And they struggle to go forward. But when Christians come together, we have the truth. We have God's Word. And we know it's not all over. The moment you leave this body, you're present with the Lord. So we rejoice. And we come together and we go, our funerals aren't hopeless, but they're filled with hope, anticipation, amen, that one day we're going to be reunited, that our loved ones are with Jesus. Anybody have hope here today? Amen. I said, does anybody have a genuine hope here today? We have hope. It's real. Paul said in verse 13, I don't want you to be ignorant. He wants us to know the truth. And notice the comfort that he brings in verse 13, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Church, I can't tell you how thankful I am for that. The genuine hope that it brings. In verse 14, look at that passage with me. It says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. That's a very important point that Paul is making. He's saying this hope isn't for everyone. This hope is only for those who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So he, it's a conditional clause. 
If you don't know Christ, if you haven't received his forgiveness, if you don't have his presence and his power in your life, then there isn't that hope that Paul's talking about. Amen? And he goes on. Well, in Romans, I, I want to give you another. It's so simple to receive the Lord. Amen? Aren't you glad? Aren't you thankful? It's not hard to receive him. And Paul talks about it in Romans. This is the way he says, says in Romans. He says, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. Most of us know this by heart. There, that if you confess your mouth, with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Aren't you thankful for that today? But there is a condition for us to have this hope, but it's also an invitation. Amen? Paul is also inviting everyone who reads this and who he's speaking to to have that assurance in that relationship with Christ. And if you're here today and you're not sure where you stand, I want to invite you to join the family. I want to invite you to have that hope, to have that assurance, to have that presence of Jesus in your heart and in your life. When you leave this place, you'll be walking in victory. You'll be born again. You'll know without a doubt, Jesus is on the throne and in control. He's Lord of all. You have a future in Him. You have victory in Him. It's not just something that we make up. It's not a religious thing. Because we're dead spiritually without Him. But then He gives us new birth spiritually. Amen? And we're alive in Him. Paul in this passage is teaching a truth about those loved ones who have died in Christ. I want you to think about this. In verse 16, For the Lord Himself will de descend from heaven with a shout. <laughs> I don't know exactly what Jesus is going to be shouting. There are those that think that Revelation chapter 10 and verse 6 is referring to that. And it says, there should be delay no longer. And if that's not it, I think it'll probably be something like that. Jesus is going to be excited. He's coming to gather together His bride. And He's going to be shouting over you with excitement. And he'll probably be saying something just like that. De delay no longer. I'm coming to get my bride. <laughs> I love that. It reminds me 2,000 years ago on the cross, Jesus spoke seven things from the cross. The last thing he spoke was, Father, I commend my spirit unto you. But the second to the last thing, he declared, It is finished. That's what he said on the cross. And he wasn't talking about his life ending. He was talking about our redemption being fully, completely accomplished by his work on the cross. Every sin was paid for. Every sin, every mistake, every evil thing that we thought of or done, it was covered by the precious blood of Jesus. And I, I thank God that that's not the only time he's shouting. He's coming back and he's shouting again. Amen? It was finished. Somebody's with me. <laughs> Praise God. Now when we think about this, I want, you, I want you to think of it in this way. It is not a further completion of salvation in the sense of the provision of salvation but of this experience of salvation. There is a coming day when our Savior, He cried, it is finished, but now He's going to cry, I've waited long enough. I'm gathering my own. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 12, some think that this might possibly be what the angel is, the voice of the archangel is saying. This is actually in the context of the two witnesses, but I think it could very well be the same. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here! <laughs> and they ascended to heaven in a cloud. 
Are you looking forward to that day? There's going to be the voice of an archangel. And we're going to be caught up to be with Jesus in the air. I like that. Now that brings us to the word rapture. I've heard people say, why do they always talk about rapture? That word's not in the Bible. Well, it's not in the Bible, but the idea is certainly in the Bible. It, it comes from the original Latin word, of raptu, which means the same thing that we think about in rapture, a, a snatching, a seizing, seizing, being caught up. But it also, how many of you have ever heard a beautiful piece of music? And you were raptured. You were caught up in it. Or how many of you ever looked at a beautiful painting? In Anchor Point, there's a, there, believe it or not, there, in Anchor Point, there is a world famous artist. If you're ever down on the peninsula, you need to stop and see his artwork because it's just astounding. And I can remember going into his studio and looking at some of the masterpieces that he had painted, and I was raptured by them, caught up in them. Also, I can remember many years ago when I was on the college campus of Southwestern Assemblies of God University, and there was this cute little girl named Melinda, and I was raptured every time I was in her presence. <laughs> So we understand what rapture means, don't we? And in the Greek word that's in this text, for caught up is harpazo. That's the Greek word. And what, and what it means is to see suddenly, to catch away, to pluck, pull, or to take. And we relate it. In Alaska, it's very easy for us because most of us have been out on the lake or the ocean. We've seen great eagles swoop down and grab a hold of a fish and take off. Just snatch it out of the, out of the water. And that's the idea that we see in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The greatest example that we have of being raptured is in Acts chapter 8, verse 39, where the Holy Spirit's action transfers Philip from one location to another location instantly. And we can't explain that. The Holy Spirit takes him, he instantly disappears, and he appears someplace else. It's an interesting story. And it's not Star Trek. It's not Beam Me Up Scotty. Just want to clarify that. It's the power of the Holy Spirit snatching up the bride of Christ in an instant. Amen. I want you to notice verse 9 or in uh, chapter 5, the very next chapter, because this is a key for us when we think about the return of the Lord. For God did not appoint us to wrath. I want you to say that with me. For God did not appoint us to wrath. Say it again. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. That verse assures us. Now it doesn't say we will not experience trial or difficulty, trouble or tribulation. In fact, Jesus himself said, in this world you will experience tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. How many ever experience a little trial or difficulty in this life? All of us do. It's part of life in this fallen world we live in. But we are guaranteed in the word of God we will not experience the great outpouring of the wrath of God that's going to come upon this world. That's a great place to say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, when we think about the outpouring of the wrath of God, it's very sad that this world's going to have to go through that horrible judgment. And it's not God getting even. 
It's not God saying, I don't like what you did, and this is what you get for it. Everywhere we see God's judgment in Scripture, this is a powerful truth we need to understand. Everywhere we see judgment, God using judgment in Scripture, it brings freedom. It brings deliverance. When God brings that great final judgment, He is cleansing the world. He's dealing with what man has done and continues to do by his sin, by the evil that we allow in this world, that we condone in this world, that we participate with in this world, the disobedience to God, and it is simply coming to the end of what God says, now we've got to deal with this. This is what you've chosen as mankind. This is the direction you've gone. This is what happens when you go against my design. And it's going to bring the ultimate cleansing and freedom from all of man's corruption. And thank God the redeemed are never going to have to experience that. In Revelation chapter 10 verse 7, it talks about that time. It says, but in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be finished as he declared to his servants, the prophets. This is the time of the outpouring of God's wrath. And you and I can say, hallelujah, we're not going to experience it. Now there's something else that I want us to note. Look at this passage again. Look at verse 13. It uses the phrase, fallen asleep. And then in verse 14, those who sleep in Jesus. And then verse 15, those who are asleep. Three times in this passage, it refers to those who are dead in Christ as being asleep. Now this has brought some confusion into the body of the church because there are those that believe this talks about soul sleep. They believe that it's saying that we just kind of go into oblivion. We don't dream. We don't do anything. We're just there until Jesus returns. In other words, they think your soul is just sleeping. But that is not what this is saying. And I want to repeat that. That is not what this is saying. I want us to understand without any doubt what Scripture does say. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Amen? And even notice in our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 14, what does it say? God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. It, does it get any plainer than that? Where are the dead believers in Christ? There with Jesus. Amen? There with Jesus. The reason that Paul is using this term is because Jesus himself used it in talking about Lazarus. Okay, that's where it originated. Look, up, look it up. You can see, Jesus uses it. Why? Because Jesus broke the power of death and the fear of death on the cross. And he rose again the third day. Amen? In other words, sure. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Get with me. The church can't use the word death in talking about believers who've gone to be with Jesus because they're more alive now than they have ever, ever been. Their body is dead. The body, yes, is decay, but they have a spiritual body that looks just probably a lot like what we do look like. It's a spiritual body, but they are with Jesus they're worshiping Him, they're praising Him, they're in His presence, they're fellowshipping with one another, and they will come back with Him, be reunited with the resurrected bodies and us, and we're going to be called up to be with Jesus. That's part of the hope. 
That's part of the excitement. I know without a doubt, my dad is with Jesus. My dad is with Jesus. I wouldn't bring him back now if I could. And he'd be mad if I did. He's not in any pain. He's young. He's got hair again. He's good looking. I believe our glorified bodies, it says we will be like him. Jesus was 33 years old. I think we're going to look like we did when we were about 33. Anybody like that idea? Hallelujah. Death has been robbed. Worship team, will you come? It's not an honest description for us to speak of our loved ones in Christ as dead. It's not. The power and the fear that death has had over us has been broken. We do not walk in fear. We do not live in fear or the power of death. If you are afraid of dying today, you need to come and pray with one of our prayer team today because that is not of God. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And the power of fear is broken. The power of death is broken. I'm not worried. Church, I was thinking yesterday during the funeral. I'm really tempted to preach my own funeral. (laughs) One of these days I'm going to call Thomas in here and Yuri, and we're going to set it up and I'm going to preach my own funeral. Because I don't want any tears I don't want anybody that isn't celebrating because I'm with Jesus. And that's the way we should look at it. That's the hope we have, church. Fear is broken. The power of death is broken. When Jesus comes, we're all going to be caught up together. Those that have died in Christ, those that have been translated, we're going to be with him. Amen. We're going to be with him. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. ever. (laughs) Stand up with me. We're going to continue this because I I only got about halfway through. We're going to continue this next Sunday. I want you to come. I want you to be excited. I want you to be praying because church, there is an eternal state. And we who know Jesus and love Him, we need to be concerned about those that don't. Some of us have family, some of us have friends that don't know the Lord. We need to be concerned and in prayer. Lord, whatever it takes. I had a good friend that called me this week. He said he walked in to his daughter's place and they found his daughter on the floor in a trance with satanic books around her and it broke his heart he said I don't know what to do and I prayed with him I told him I would continue to pray and I want our church to pray Whatever it takes, Lord, get a hold of that young lady and turn her life around. Let her see, Lord. Lift that veil from her eyes. Let her see her need for Jesus Christ. That she can have that hope and that assurance. If the prayer team would come forward, we're going to open the altars. If you have a need today, will you come and pray with us? If you have a need today, will you come? Bring that need to Jesus. We want to pray with you. If you're not sure where you stand with the Lord, will you step out from where you are and come? If you've drifted away and you want to rededicate your life, will you come? If you're sick in body, you need a healing touch, will you come? If emotionally you're struggling, you're with depression, discouragement, will you come? Whatever your need is today, will you bring it to Jesus?
will you bring it to you? Stuff. 